Hey guys, Diana here from Garden Love. I'm here at Steve Liss's workshop. Uh, just finished, as you can see, most of the people are leaving with bags of goodies that he gave away today. He gave away a lot of fruit trees, uh, strawberries, some um, lettuces, some plugs for tomatoes. So we can experiment to see if we can make them last till spring's here and a lot lots of other things but today what i want to share with you is a special guest that he brought to talk to us about pruning your stone trees and all um you know like your pomegranates and all the good stuff and his name is Elliot he has a farm called CU farm you can find him on Instagram and he gave out so much good information that I am just so excited to post this video so you guys can all benefit from it that's part of the reason why I do these videos when we have guest speakers because you guys all benefit from it and also because I benefit from it and in the future when I want to recall some information that one of these guest speakers uh, mentioned I could just go to my videos and just rewind and see what he said in the topic so I'm really excited to share this with you guys I hope you guys enjoy it if you guys have any questions leave it in the comments down below and uh, if you like it give me some thumbs up and I'll see you guys in the next one enjoy the video quickly I'm just gonna for a brief outline I'm gonna talk about the tools sharpening and sanitation proper cuts and kind of the general philosophy on how you approach a tree on a basic platform and then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about deciduous fruit tree pruning and kind of the different things that happen with different types of trees. But I really think if you learn how to make a proper cut with clean, sharp tools, the rules beyond that, and when you do it, the rules beyond that kind of wash away. So you don't need to worry so much, well, it's this type of tree and I didn't do, yeah, let's just talk about tools and, and, and sharp and good cuts. So if you do not have a pair of bypass pruners get some all right <laughs> these are your best friend I would say 80% of my pruning can be done with these all right these are this is a uh, brand called Baco B-A-H-C-O they're like Felcos they have the rotating handle all right so when you're in there all day you're not getting uh, wear and tear on your hands but a good these are called bypass pruners these are the best I think in a garden all right so a pair of bypass pruners is your number that's always on your hip, ready to go. <coughs> saws. Folding saws are the easiest because they fit in your back pocket, right? Mm -hmm. You can get the big, huge ones, but these can cover most. This is a pretty uh, large tooth for taking out larger limbs. You can also back set it, so if you're doing an undercut. So this is for larger limbs. This is for finer limbs. We see the difference in the serration of the teeth there. All right. I feel like between these two, pretty much I can cover everything. Uh, this, I can go through a four inch diameter uh, limb or trunk with this. Does it take a little bit of time? Yes. But is it pretty easy? Absolutely, right? So this is really good for larger limbs. This is good for smaller, more fine stuff, all right? Uh, not necessary, but a little smaller one. Sometimes when you have branches really tight together, right? A little smaller saw is a little nicer. Again, you can set it back, get your undercut. So, say it again. What is the? Uh, this one is called the Pocket Boy. Uh, <laughs> it is made by uh, Silky. Silky Saws makes a bunch of these. Um, you know, if you're not opposed to online shopping, you can find these. If you go locally, most times you're going to find either Felco or Corona, and both of those are quality. All right. But a nice pruning saw and a nice set of uh, bypass pruners, you can do the bulk of your pruning on fruit trees in your home garden. All right, a need for a chainsaw and stuff like that, not necessary, all right? For, for bigger jobs, uh, you can actually buy pruning blades for sawzalls, and I have used those. And that pretty much eliminates the need to take a chainsaw with you uh, when I've done bigger pruning jobs in other orchards, but these right here. So Silky, Paco, there you go. Uh, cleanliness, all right? Keep your stuff clean. For me, uh, I'll demonstrate how I clean it, but I do it at the uh, at the end of all my pruning. I go through and clean all my tools and I put them back in my Tupperware. And that way I know when I go to the next pruning job, I can put them in the state where it's ready to step into pruning. Uh, Steve already mentioned it, but it, the idea that you don't want to spread disease, right? So if you're pruning off dead and infected wood, um, I keep this. Uh, this is a solution. If you're with water, just cut. Uh, I'll 
try it. I'll spray it up in the. No, I don't want to spray it because I don't want to hit you. But all right, a little pump spray and I have to clean it off. So I've taken off uh, a brand that's really king. Uh, this is something I just spray in the field. But otherwise, it's at the end of my pruning routine. I do this. This is uh, turpentine. We all know turpentine. Uh, there's a great pruner here in LA. His name's Herb McAleeder. He's worked with Steve a ton. Uh, he's an old chemistry professor, and he throws out the term "like dissolves like." All right, turpentine is derived from pine sap, so it does a fantastic job of taking sap off of your pruners. All right, so turpentine—it smells. All right, strong odor, so just be wary. But a little turpentine in a little spray bottle, or even not a spray bottle, if you just put it on a cloth, it does a great job of getting sap and stuff off of your tools. Do I dilute those at all? I don't dilute it. It's just in here, and you, a little goes a long way, right? So um, if I'm cleaning, I'll just start with this. I'll take a little bit of turpentine, spray it on there. I have my uh, little brush, my little metal brush, right? Little steel brush. I can get all the debris and gunk off of this guy that I used for pruning. Yesterday I was doing these in my garden. These are here for folks to take. That's the Desert Delight. Yes. And I've got sap dripping on my concrete. I can use the turpentine. I would say give it a shot. I can't vouch for that. It comes really off off of the metal really easily. I something porous like cement might be a little bit harder. But yeah, give it a shot. That's what Herb said to me. He was because I used to use like mineral spirits and other stuff. And he's like, like dissolves like. And I was like, he's like, you have yes. turpentine? And I'm like, yes. He's like, that's what you should be cleaning with. So um, a simple wash, a little scrub. I've gotten all the gunk off. I finish, bleach, sterilize. You could also dunk it if we're really concerned about it, but I feel like just a little bit of a sterilization. These are ready to go, yes? Uh, uh, you can, yeah. Uh, I mean, rubbing alcohol does a good job of removing resins, so it could work. Uh, for me, her turn me on to turpentine. That's what I've been using. Yeah. Sorry, I uh, did not hear that question. What about sharpening? Sharpening. So that's just exactly what I was going to go into. Uh, sharpening. This little tool is the Walti Sharp, made in the UK. Cheap as chips, super easy to use, all right? So this is the Walti Sharp. This is for bypass printers. This clips onto the top side of the blade. Um, let me, you tighten it down. Normally I use my little screwdriver, but for now I'll just tighten it by hand. This sits on the top of the blade like this. This is essentially a little emery board. And you have three, you have about four holes here to find the angle of your bypass printer. You set this in here. And you literally just go along the face. Let me tighten it down. I'm rushing. I got my time. I'll, I'll take it back. Here. Tighten it down. Again, I do this at the end of my pruning, right? So that when I get into my pruning each time, it's already done. Okay. So this is locked onto the top. You can, if I put it here, right, you can see that's a really steep angle. This one actually is really, really shallow, so it's right here. You see how that sits on there? And basically that just lets me come across the face of this and sharpen it. This is all you need to do, all right? Super simple. I'm kind of fumbling it right now. I'm a little nervous. Uh, usually I'm in my like my room by myself just sharpening it. But, all right, so super simple. Um, these are already pretty sharp, so I'm not gonna belabor the point. This is one style. Another one I have is called a Speedy Sharp. Really super simple. Uh, if you had a really nicked up uh, set of pruners, you can actually use this to rehone the edge. All right, but basically same principle, dragging it along the edge, matching the angle of your sharpener. They have super simple ones too, where uh, it's almost kind of like a stone that you can use. There's a million different types of sharpeners. For me, this has been the most foolproof. 
All right, this is super simple, super easy, super cheap. If I lose this, I'm not worried about spending five bucks to buy a new one. Uh, uh, where would we buy one? Where what? Where would we buy one? Uh, you might find these at your local nursery, so there might be something like this at Green Thumb. If you're not opposed to online shopping or big corporations like Amazon, you can for sure find them. There. Uh, say it again. This is a Speedy Sharp. This one is known as the Multi Sharp, made in the UK. Multi Sharp, Speedy Sharp. Uh, but sharp tools, right? You want to be working with sharp tools. Uh, unfortunately, with these, I haven't found a reliable way, nor am I at proficient enough at sharpening, to really sharpen each of these teeth. Uh, I've had this for over two years now, and I see as long as I clean the gunk out after every uh, pruning session, I've seen little to no difference in the, in the performance of this, all right? So I would say that these will last you a good couple years, all right? This again is made by Silky, all right? Um, but so with uh, the turpentine and the wire brush, I make sure to dig out everything in the teeth, right? If the teeth are filled up, you're really limiting the amount of cutting surface that you're getting on your uh, pull and stroke there, all right? So clean, sharp tools, yes? Um, so uh, I guess we'll move into the four types of cuts. All right, these are affectionately known as the four Ds, if you want to write that down. The four Ds of pruning. Uh, I'll give you the name and then we'll go into each one. The four Ds are dead, diseased, damaged, and deranged. <laughs> All right, dead, diseased, damaged, and deranged. All right. Um, so Stefan's holding this up. Uh, this is off uh, a really early nectarine called Desert Delight. If you like yellow flesh nectarines, I highly recommend this varietal. Again, from Dave Wilson, the nursery that Steve mentioned. Uh, it usually sets flowers here in January. They do have fruit by mid-May. Super early variety. This was an awesome branch. And what you can see is it's still going to produce, all right? I feel like people get tripped up on trimming that they're, or pruning that they're going to hurt this tree, right? That, oh, well, if I cut too much, I'm going to kill the tree. Really unlikely. This has shot hole bore issues and sun scold down at the bottom where Stefan had his hand. Look how much fruit this was set to produce, all right? Uh, but this is a basically, if we're going to go into, this is diseased, all right? So for me, although it had a nice structure, it was kind of splayed out, it was on the side of the, the tree like this. Uh, I decided to remove this whole piece. And I think when you're stepping up to a tree, these four Ds is your, is your preliminary step. And honestly, if all you ever do is 4D pruning, all right, getting rid of these four types of branches, uh, you're gonna be doing fine. When we're talking about this finesse stuff of open vase and stripping and, and balancing, okay, yes, but the four Ds are essential, yes? Sunburn, I would say, is a uh, damage. All right, sun scold, and Steve mentioned the 50-50 uh, whitewashing with white uh, latex paint cut with water. That's after my pruning, so I'll finish my pruning at the end of February, and I will whitewash my whole picture afterwards, all right? It's an easy way to seal up all the cuts that you've made, and it really acts as sunblock, especially with here in the valley. In the last three years, right, mid-June, we've been getting 110 plus degree weather, right? That's something we have to account for, especially when young deciduous trees like this are just starting to leaf out, all right? But so, uh, Can I ask you? Yes. If you do whitewash, does that last just one year, or do you? I reapply every year, all right? I reapply every year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about a seasonal thing. The whitewash is still on the trees, but a seasonal thing. Um, and the four Ds are kind of interlacing, all right? So here we go. This is a dead branch right here, right? It's also damaged. Uh, so you can take that off. Um, but so those are the simple things. Dead, diseased, damaged, deranged. All right, let, let me highlight deranged here if we can find an example. Yes, yes, perfect. Does everyone know Stefan? <laughs> I tell Stefan that we're having a hair race and then he knows what he's going to look like in 10 years. <laughs> um, 10? All right, maybe 15? 20, okay. Um, so uh, here we go, deranged. Um, I don't know if you can see that huge 
wish you could lift this up above here, all right? Can you see that huge arcing branch? Yeah. And it's rubbing against that vertical branch, all right? It's creating a huge wound in that tree, all right, as the wind comes. So that's rubbed off the cambium layer, all right? So that, to me, would qualify as deranged, all right? It's moved in a way that is not serving the longevity of that tree. So deranged, just because the four Ds is a little easier to say, right? But things that are crossing or creating an issue for the tree, all right? Will that tree still exist with that branch deranged? Yes. But me as the guardian of that tree, I would like to take care of it, right? And try to promote things that will give it a uh, healthier and longer lifespan. So... Most likely, yes. Most likely the friction of that is rubbed it off on that north side of that branch. All right? So that's an easy one to spot when you start seeing those friction points. So Stefan found this one right here, right? If this were to mature another season on the tree, it's running right into the crotch of this other branch, all right? This is something that if it was still on the tree, I would come by and remove it, right? Does that make sense? This notion of we want it, if you're just thinking like your ideal fake Christmas tree, right? Everything is balanced and even and, and kind of in its own plane. That's what we're trying to promote. And nine times out of ten, by going through this checklist, uh, removing dead, disease, damage, you're going to also simultaneously take care of the range, right? So it's just kind of giving that space in the room that branches can exist in their own plane and they're not in conflicting with uh, other ones. Um, other than that, this was kind of an even space tree, but, uh, because in the context of the tree it was on, this had grown into and so this whole thing is actually creating friction points on it, so I took this one. Um, let's pause there. I guess I'll talk briefly about the types of cuts you make, all right? Um, when I go prune other people's orchards, uh, lots of times you just see missed cuts. And I think if you can understand where you make a cut and how you make a cut, um, you're going to eliminate a lot of the issues that uh, we see on trees, all right? So there's basically two cuts. There's a heading cut and there's a removal cut, all right? Uh, in both cases, you're always bringing it back to a specific point. So we're gonna start with a heading. A heading cut basically means I'm reducing that branch or limb back to a node. When I say node, I'm talking about a bud, all right? So let me take this off as an example, but can we see this little bud here? All right, that's a node. In between that and the next no node is the internode, all right? Uh, whenever you make a cut, you're cutting back to a node, all right? Directly above it, all right? And so uh, I guess maybe it would be easier if I use one that has a flower. Right? Uh, okay. uh, let's get to that one second. We see this flower, all right? If I was reducing, I'm going to reduce back to this flower node, all right? I would cut back right above it at a 45 degree angle in the direction of the node or bud that I'm keeping. Does that make sense? So the flower is going that way, right above it, and I'm making a little cut like that. I feel like if you're really paying attention to that when you step back for a tree, from a tree that you've pruned back to nodes, it's hard for someone to tell that you've made pruned cuts, right? Because the dominant thing is you've left that bud there. Growth, this is gonna, I'm not gonna get into terms like apical dominance, but basically by putting this in the top, it's gonna really take over and set the direction of that branch. So I would never wanna just come across and leave that nub. All right, that inner node is gonna die back, that inv invites disease, right, damage. Um, so you're always cutting 45 in the direction of a bud. Make sense? Pretty simple. Yeah, so I wouldn't wanna cut right into the node, all right? If I if I spliced it like that, you basically, around a bud, there's what we call a little, uh, there's a collar. There's a swelling on that branch, all right? That's what, you've seen a nice tree cut and it closes over like a donut. All right, that's because that cambium layer is left on all sides and that branch collar can close and seal. I uh, once had an arborist tell me, trees don't heal, they seal, all right? That wound stays with them, but they will close it up inside of them. All right, and they will create pathways around. You don't want to leave that. You don't want to cut into that flare around the node. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. This is a lot of people to try to talk to. So, uh, and, and, yeah.
very friendly, absolutely. Just Steve's a hard act to follow. He's so charismatic. Yeah, look at him. He's like, yes, I know. Um, okay, a removal cut. Let's bring that tree up. A removal cut, a removal cut. So that was a heading cut, right? Somewhere on that branch, I'm bringing it back. Here's a 45 heading. A removal is this whole branch needs to go and I'm bringing it back to the tree, all right? Same thing applies. You can see the flare, right? The branch collar. Do not cut into that, all right? But you don't want to leave a stub with no bud on it out here. All that is going to do is die. All right, so if I'm gonna come back, it's right at it and it's perpendicular to the way it's going. So that 45 is coming right here across it. I've left that little bump and that will close over and seal that wound, all right? That is a removal cut. So let's say, this is gonna be a little drastic, but you see this huge branch here? Yeah. It's really not needed for this tree. Uh, everything else is down here, right? Super small. This has got this swirly over dominant so if I'm coming back, I'm going to remove it. Right? That's nothing. You should be here when this guy does roses. He just comes in and, all right? Chainsaw. I think that's a clear example. You can see the 45 cut. The, the branch collar's there to seal that. And now we have some more of this uh, stuff. This is kind of a... Should I just go through this like I'm just going to prune it? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Because... Yeah, um, yeah, when you did that, it was so counterintuitive, and that's why I got the reaction from the crowd. Definitely. Like, that's the tree. What are you doing? Ah. Yeah. Uh, so what you're saying is it's going to recover and build stronger branches like that with all these smaller ones? Definitely. So these right here, if we're going through our checklist, are dead. And if you want to ever check, you can take your pruners, scratch the bark. If it's brown underneath, it's dead, right? You can feel it, too. It's dry. It's going to crack. If you nick it and it's got, it's okay, well you see that green, that green flap, living, right? So if, if it's ever in question, because sometimes it's hard to tell during winter season, right? But that's a really easy way, but I can tell you right now, that's dead. This is dead. This is dead. All right, here's dead. This is nice, growing. Kind of a weird setup here. This is dead. This is living. Um, so again, too, when we would plant this, we'd want to get this nice and upright. Uh, if we're looking at the balance, this is pretty heavily weighted at this point, right? So we can imagine that it's really going to take off and start bending down. A young tree, I'm going to come back. Here's an outward facing bud. Or, uh, <laughs> that, uh, all right. The heading cut back to the bud, 45 in the direction. All right. I think when you're talking about young fruit trees, I'm jumping around here. But young fruit trees, it's delayed gratification. This young fruit tree, you really are expecting to get fruit out of it for the first two to three years. Okay, because you're building structure for the longevity of this tree. to it where you're going to try to mitigate things like branch uh, rips and stuff like that. When I first started, I didn't really know about that. So I'm like, man, look how much it grew. And, it sat on and then it just ripped the branch down the side of the trunk and gave me a huge gash into it, right? So there's that delayed gratification. If you can put off for a year or two, right? Trees are on this different spectrum than seasonal vegetables. Seasonal vegetables, we're talking about months. Trees, we're talking about years, all right? So for me, it's about building the balance into the tree. This right here is kind of a squirrely top. Maybe if we channel the energy into this or this one, and I'm gonna go for that one. So right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a decision. Uh, if we're talking about training methods, uh, with peach nectarine, you can apply this to apples as well. We train to what's called an open face. So if you're training a young tree, and uh, Stefan will bring up more, we do more examples. You basically take out the central leader and you spiral branches outwards, like a hand face upwards, all right, like a candelabra. 
that's one style of pruning, but it's very effective and, and applicable. If you see the branches are sliding in different directions around this, I don't really have ones competing in the same direction. These are kind of in the same direction, but I could do something like pull it with a piece of string to the ground just to set this for the season. This one could be pulled into that direction. So that when you're looking down from the top, it's kind of spiraling around that central trunk. You can think about, right, that balance, right? That balance on the strong center trunk, okay? So a little drastic, but this is a young tree. Again, those two cuts, reduction and removal. Elliot, I also, you get really afraid about cutting the tree, so I get why everybody's having the panic moments, but would you say that's really like building the foundation so that it actually can grow and not become this spindly thing you mentioned breaking branches yeah you want it it's, fruit doesn't exactly especially for young trees you're trying if if you gave me a bare root so he gave that beautiful bare root uh to uh monica rodriguez i would take that thing and hammer it down to 30 inches if there was branches below that great if there wasn't i'm not worried about it uh, because you're going to restart it in this situation and it is about for a backyard most of us are backyard orchard people right we're keeping fruit trees for our family it's not about maximizing production it's not about having this massive tree that i need ladders to harvest from so a tight compact tree i think is a benefit to the most uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand because I'm doing a series of these workshops and I'm trying to synthesize for myself there are rules right but there's not really per se a if you're making a good cut there's not a wrong way to prune this tree does that make sense yeah uh, I'm just wondering so what is the effect if you take like the top inch off you go to the first node on that so if I came back to here let's say yeah. uh, this gets what is called apical dominance, all right? So the tree knows that this node is at the top and it's kind of going to be like, you know what, I'm up here, the rest of you stay down there. And it sends more nutrients to that tree, so more vigor is going to come into this leading branch. Uh, by removing it, uh, we're shortening it up and we're giving ourselves for next season, or this growing season, opportunities for new branching to occur. So that next year we might say, well, geez, you know what, this shot a really solid from this note this way and I need that direction because I don't have anything here. Maybe I'm going to come back here next season and this branch takes off that way. Okay. Gives you that option. So when you tip them off like you did, you're encouraging more growth beneath it. More growth beneath it, uh, especially as the tree gets older, I'm also just bringing down that fruiting wood rather than it getting ever and ever further away from me. Uh, I've learned that lesson too, right? There was, in the beginning I was timid about pruning. I was like, oh, I'm just going to put them, oh, look how happy they are. And then I, I didn't do these approaches and now I have trees that are very gangly and all the fruiting wood is here as opposed to right here where I would like it to be. So you're kind of doing this early start to keep it compact. It's growing like a... Just like, like, almost like, yeah. Okay. And should I top it? Olives are evergreen. Olives want to be multi-trunk, even though we sell them as standard trees where they've been, you're kind of fighting the nature of that tree. The olive really wants to be a multi-trunk, large shrub kind of deal. Uh, you can top it. It's a little drastic, uh, and I, I I don't know if I would encourage that. It would be hard for me to say that without seeing it. Uh, if you're, what is your concern about the tree, that it's just too tall? Down below. Yeah, talk to me afterwards and we can kind of maybe dialogue. I guess one thing I would say is this book right here, How to Prune Fruit Trees by R. Sanford Martin. I happened to find this in a drawer into the house I moved in before I was even into fruit trees. And I felt like it was like this mystical thing that unfolded for me. Uh, it was published in Van Nuys, California in 1945. Wow. Right? Uh, this guy was from this area and this knowledge still holds up today. All right, it's a fantastic book and it goes by tree. So it goes by apple, olive, fig, persimmon, all of it's in here. 
it's a little dry, he can get a little technical, all right, but again, stepping back. So if you know how to make those two proper cuts and what, when to make them, you're going to be okay. You're not going to do this damage to the tree. If you're in here with a saw and just hacking things and leaving tattered edges, problems are going to occur, okay? But making those good cuts, getting a little resource that maybe guides you on that. So at the end, come up and we'll look at the olive page. Maybe we'll have a, we'll have a better answer. This squirrely plum satsuma, wow. It's not good, right? It's put all of its energy in here. Okay, so what trees have, they have emergency buds below the cambium, all right? They're reserve buds. So imagine if this tree's growing in the wild, uh, this part burns or another limb cracks it. It has the ability to force buds out of this lower trunk, even though we don't see buds on this trunk right now. Okay, so kind of hard to prune back per se to a uh, budding area. There seems like there's a lot dead, but I think we're just gonna do this for the fun of it. Be okay, we'll be okay, it's happening. I'm sorry guys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Way too much growth for that young tree. You're gonna get a tree that only puts fruiting wood that high up. We're restarting it. All right. This has got to go home with someone today, and it's got to go in the ground. Okay. <laughs> Don't leave this in the pot anymore. Though it will restart, but ideally get it into the pot. Okay. Um, it's gonna force budding from down below. All right. And now we have the option to try to create something balanced here. So let's step over to this guy. Uh, if we're going through our four D's, dead. This nub at the top is clearly dead, no growth. This is my new leader. It's a nice balanced leader. This right here, scraping it. It's got a little bit of life, but dead. Over here, dead. These are kind of nice alternating branches. Um, ideally, if okay, perfect world, these branches would be spiraled around the center around a hand's width apart, all going in different directions, okay? That can happen over time. Hold that ideal in your mind. You don't need to force it. For now, I'm gonna leave both of these this season. I'm gonna get an option about which way this goes. Maybe uh, a leaf bud really kicks out a nice branch going this way and I can use that as a split, okay? Here's another dead branch on this side. Removal cut. And maybe I just head this one back to an outward facing bud. 45 shooting this way. But that has a pretty nice balance to it. All right, pretty nice balance to it. I would put that in the ground to be fine with letting it go. This right here, let's see. Brown, going. Goodbye. <laughs> Can we just see that where you're building balance to it? All right, it's kind of like sculpting, right? You're chipping away. Uh, I just feel like release yourself from A, that you're hurting the tree, and, and B, that. Um, you need to adhere to some textbook that, okay, well, this apple has to be, no, it's just make a good cut and find that balance to it, right? That, that's something that we, we as humans, we see symmetry in things, right? We can see that happen. So trying to build that. Uh, yeah. My apple tree has a bunch of flowers. Yes. And it's kind of tall and stringy. Yes. Can I prune that one? Yeah, so you can prune it back. So this all came off of this Desert Delight peach, all right? Uh, a peach that is mature. Uh, these are six-year-old trees that I've planted as bare roots six years ago. They're now in their sixth leaf, all right? Um, on a peach like that, I remove 50 to 60% of the flowering wood. Wow. It's too much. It's too much for that tree. If all of that turned into peaches, all it's going to do is bend and snap that branch, all right? So that's another one. Once you're getting into it with your apples, remove some of that fruiting wood, all right? And especially... Uh, this had a ton of fruiting wood, but it had a lot of disease in it, so it needed to come off, right? This was a sacrifice of a pretty substantial branch for the sake of removing one of those four D's. tree's about a year old. Year old. Okay, so year old, yeah, you can do structural pruning. Okay. Get it, get, get it to some branches you like, that okay. you want to see, if it's a year old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, do you mind if I go ahead, man? No, yeah. you can answer. Huh, huh. So, if I want to take that and uh, nothing. Uh, no, I mean, all of its energy is into flowering. Uh, I kind of trick these by, I cut them off right as they were about to pop. I put them in water and I moved them in the house where it's still warm. Uh, I put a little P1 in the water, so it kind of has the energy to produce the energy. It's not a 
vegetative state. So really it's going to expand its energy on these flowers and it'll be good firewood for you. Okay. You guys good? Yes. Can you hit continue? Yes. Okay, I'm going to have to pay time to have this. <laughs> My alarm didn't go off. I'm going, no, I'm just, I have you nine minutes. Fine. I have nowhere to go. Okay. Well, you got as long as you want. Well, I've got nine minutes. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, go there and then we'll go. So, uh, uh, you were saying uh, removing fruiting yes, wood is necessary. That's I answered your question. Uh, removing, removing fruiting wood is necessary in order to avoid uh, the uh, branches from getting overweight and breaking. Or, um, what about uh, when do you decide to remove the fruiting wood versus just removing some of the fruit yeah. as it as it starts to develop so that you don't get the fruit? Uh, the question is when you remove fruiting wood versus removing the fruit. So I made all these questions, I went through my four D's on this tree, I removed these branches, I still have a substantial amount of fruit set on that tree, all right? I also keep bees, so for me, this is a fantastic early forage for bees, right? So I feed the rest of the I've created my structure, I don't go through rub off flowers, I leave the flowers on the tree, I let them be pollinated. When the fruit on that remaining tree, on the tree that I, the branches I left was about the side, less than a golf ball, but maybe larger than an almond, I go through and I rub off fruit so that there's maybe a bud about every width of my hand. Okay? Uh, a chef mine takes that stuff and he pickles it. I don't know, never tried it, but you could try that if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, I just let it hit the ground and go into the mulch. So with inner known space like that, you're taking out half to two thirds of the fruit. Yes. Uh, let's see, like, we're saying, so let's say on this little branch, I don't even know if I would keep that little branch, but uh, there's three little fruit potentials on that. Let's, let's say it was already part of it. The tree, its purpose for making fruit is to spread its seed, right? So it's going to make as many as possible. That's all it's thinking about. It's not thinking, well, I'm making this tasty fruit for a human. No. <laughs> all right? So you're trying to basically, again, it's bring that order and balance. If you have clusters of peaches, you're never going to get that huge baseball sized peach if you leave all of that fruit on there. So thin it out. And the easiest way for me is, if I'm keeping that one, and there's one out there, I'm removing that, and it's about the width of my hand, okay? It's a really, there's one, there's one, about the width of my hand or my four fingers, okay? Um, removal of the fruit is huge, all right? If you want good fruit set, don't leave all the flowers on there. It's fine to, I mean, don't leave all the fruit on there. It's fine to leave the flowers if you're even letting the pollination happen. Um, on a fruiting branch, so let's say this was actually still on the tree. This is a lot of weight on this tree. So I might head it back to here. I might remove that one and I might balance this out. You can imagine if this was gonna set fruit here, this branch is gonna be like this by the end of the season, right? Yeah. So I might come back to an outward facing bud here and shorten these up a little bit, right? Again, and then when I get to thinning the fruit, way less weight on this little tiny strong branch. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So again, making that balance. I might just kind of come back a little bit more balanced than something that's going to set fruit here and potentially rip that whole branch off. Again, not a right or wrong. I'm offering you how I would approach it, but making those proper cuts is essential. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm never just cutting in between the nodes. I'm not just hacking in between the human wounds in the tree. So bringing it back to that proper space and thinking, always thinking of balance and evenness around the tree. Questions? Yes. Best time for all of your deciduous fruit trees, all right? So all your stone fruit, peach plum, apricot, nectarine, fluod, right now, January and February. The leaves are off. It's in a quasi-dormant state. All right, and you want to really get it before it starts putting out the flowers. All right, so when the buds are swelling, it's a nice time to come through and prune. All right, for citrus, you can prune now. What I'm telling you right now, don't do to your citrus. Okay, all you do to citrus is the four D's. 
okay? Dead, disease, damage, and derange. Just remove that. Citrus wants to have a huge, massive canopy, all right? It, the whole San Fernando Valley tree, many of you know, and many of you have those trees, was old citrus groves, all right? They will exist for a long time with zero maintenance. Same thing with avos, just getting out the weird stuff. You can do that now. Don't really prune citrus or anything in the summer, okay? I'm not going to get into it, but there is summer pruning for this stuff, but that's a different thing. So yes, stone fruit, deciduous trees now, along with avos and citrus. When it's dormant and it's not hot, right? When it's nice and cool for you to be outside, go prune, all right? Don't do it in the 110 degree heat in the middle of the summer. Yes. Uh, you can plant trees in big pots. Trees will always get bigger if you put them in the ground. All right. Fun fact about trees, however wide the canopy is, the roots are typically three times as wide. Okay? So just take a look at that here. And if you're putting it in a pot, you're limiting its ability, right? So, yeah. What about pomegranates that don't grow like regular deciduous trees? They grow like lots and lots of stuff. So that would be in line with, for me, about olives, guavas, and, and pomegranates. They're a multi-trunk tree, all right? Uh, I would say with that is if you kind of think about building the balance and trying to eliminate all of these crossing branches that are shooting up, thin it out, thin it out okay. all right? If you want to skirt it up, you can hammer pomegranates and they'll come back. It's a desert tree, mm -hmm. all right? But just think about that thing of trying to eliminate issues like that. Okay. Where you're going to get a huge branch that wears away at times. Other questions? So she's talking about a, a mature tree, a mulberry, which is very vigorous. If you have a mulberry tree, I'm sure you know. Uh, if you're really hammering it, you what you might be jeopardizing is your fruit production. Okay, so if you're taking a huge tree and you're gonna correct it real hard, that next year you might be not getting so the fruit. But it'll come back. It'll come back. But it'll take a couple of years. It needs some time. If you're doing that hard correction, it's just gonna kind of sit there. Okay. But if you're still seeing new green growth it's green it's just not producing the, yeah the fruit it's yet. putting its energy into kind of sealing to... those wounds and yeah, yeah so okay. it's fine and should i i'm sorry yeah. should i because i only did a couple of them because yeah. I, was, I was afraid to cut a lot of it back you so can do it in stages i think a good rule of thumb is you don't really want to cut if you're doing a hard corrective like that don't take out more than 30 percent of that okay. tree yeah. in a single year so and space it out yeah Yep. Okay, no. Way in the back, Ray? Or oh, that's not Ray, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you have a peach tree. It's been incorrectly pruned. Okay. Okay, it's kind of growing out all different ways. Yep. So, am I better off it? It is producing, or am I better off trying to correct it? I would say if you're seeing really noticeable signs of disease and stress on the trunk, if you're seeing if you're not seeing that, then I would say go for a hard corrective prune. Get rid of, Steve talked earlier about the suckering, right below, we can see this is a graft union. Anything growing below that graft, remove, because it's not the variety you want, all right? I would do a hard corrective prune if there's not noticeable signs of disease and see where that leaves you. Um, to me, I have a row, I planted uh, Santa Barbara peaches last year. They did not do well. They got shot. I they did, got shot whole bore right in the center of the trunk. There's these huge cankers. I'm gonna remove all three of them. It's not worth it to me to leave them in the ground because there's some serious issues in there. So I think if you have a that was my only issue. We planted some avocados and with the hot weather. Even yeah. We put umbrellas over them. Yeah. Uh, again, whitewashing the avos. If you can get on those trunks and whitewash them, goes a very long way. There's another product called Surround. It's kaolin clay. You can put it pump sprayer. It's a white slurry. You can spray leaves and fruit with it. It reduces leaf temperatures by 10 degrees. All right, surround. It's the, it's the brand name for kale and clay. Two more questions and then Steve's got to get back in here. Uh, I would say if you can cut it a nice... Oh, sorry. She's asking about suck removal. Can you just rip it off? I wouldn't. If you can get a clean cut on it, that's always going to be easier for the tree to seal it, okay? So a nice saw, if it's a larger one, or if you can get your pruners on it, 
If you have bigger loppers maybe for that tool or job. There's my timer. Last question. 